Larry, I am delighted to turn everything over to you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, as Judy mentioned, I am the depository coordinator. Um, this is um, the second video of an ongoing series of the Promoting Government Information and Maps Department. A um, little bit about myself. Um, I have an MA in history from the, as an alumni from FAU. Um, before I went on to the University of Maryland to get my Master of Library uh, Science degree. Um, today's presentation will, uh, as its title says, it will be a brief introduction to the GIS or Geographic Information System and pr uh, promote the GIS corner that we have in the library. So hopefully um, the, some of the objectives we'll have for this session was what is GIS, as you can see, some of its capabilities, and some of the um, applications and resources um, that are out there. So what is GIS? I'm sure many of you have heard the term GIS. Its official term is the Geographic Information System, where they use uh, data sets to, uh, um, and various uh, components to capture and manipulate and create mapping information. Um, m many of you probably use GIS and didn't even realize it, or you have maybe on your smartphones, you know, with GPS, uh, there's many apps that uh, use the components of GIS, um, both for map making um, on your smartphone. So, like I said, every day we're using GIS, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, things from Google Maps to, as we know, we're in hurricane season, and I believe there's a couple of uh, disturbances out there, they said this morning, so they're taking all that data to create the maps that we see on TV, to if any of you have recently looked at or thought about buying a home or selling a home, the real estate maps that we see in those uh, apps like Zillow and other uh, platforms, looking to sell, uh, looking at new homes or even just to rent a, uh, an apartment or something on that nature. So what is the GIS capable of? Well, first of all, it looks at locations, particular locations, data that's fed into the uh, software platforms that are out there, uh, conditions, trends, patterns, and even ultimately creating models. Um, as you can see from this side, there's many different applications and where G, uh, GIS is capable of using the different data sets that are out there. It's truly amazing what it's capable of and how far it's become. So why do we need GIS? Simply to help us tell the stories. Obviously, uh, there's a, uh, a, sur a resurgence in different, um, and doing research where we can, um, many different uh, areas on the campus, uh, whether it be the ge geosciences, science in general, um, or if maybe just a, a history professor looking to uh, uh, reinforce something that they're doing research and to tell a story using these various components and creating a map to tell those story, the story that they're trying to do through their research. So as I mentioned, here are some, these are some of the basic applications and their examples, you know, map making as we can see, you've seen. If you have an app that tells you um, which pathway to take, uh, roadway to take when you're driving home from FAU in the evening, um, to accident, uh, urban planning, um, down to the political maps that we see during election time, especially during the, the, the presidential elections when they're trying to figure out whose votes are in and who, what states are gonna turn red or blue. Um, so as we saw during the, uh, the recent uh, health crisis of COVID, the help get public information and public health information out there. A lot of interesting areas in which uh, GIS applications can be used. But as I mentioned, um, some of the other applications for those who are teaching businesses and the business program and, and different business uh, classes that, you know, GPS, GIS, excuse me, can be used to, if you're doing a market research and you're trying to figure out what type of company or if you, if you should move your company into a certain area, you know, depending on the saturation. As this example shows, this is dealing with supermarkets in an area of Texas. And as you can see, based on the color codes, um, where that supermarket may best fit uh, and serve the potential uh, customers. And as I mentioned earlier, obviously, if those of us remember being home, locked down, dealing with the COVID crisis, worrying about if how many cases were rising every day, uh, GIS applications, scientists were using those uh, those data points, those uh, data sets to create maps that we were seeing uh, almost on a daily basis to help us visualize how how drastic this issue was, 
where it was uh, the hot beds or the hot, hot seats were at, and to help explain the story of why COVID was what COVID, you know, how drastic COVID was affecting us, not just in the states but worldwide. As we know, um, and I mentioned, you know, GIS applications can be used for natural disasters, and obviously those of us who are used to living in Florida, and for those who are maybe attending this session or this is your first time in South Florida. We are, you know, always in a hurricane season from June 1st to the beginning of December. And, and just like I said this morning, when I checked in the morning news, there was three disturbances or possible chances of disturbances. Um, and as they grow, they will definitely be using GIS application to um, help uh, tell us where the possible landfall would be. Um, other, you know, other issues, California, when they have their fire seasons, are using data sets to help show where the heat zones are. And um, those are, have been watching the weather in general, where, you know, places like Tennessee and Kentucky just had some of the heaviest rains they've had in a long time. Again, all these different components can be used, can be using GIS applications to help um, tell those of us not necessarily in the middle of the situation what's going on and what which particular uh, natural disaster is affecting our fellow human beings. I'm sure many of us are familiar with a map similar like this. You know, it comes every four years. You don't see it so much during the off years, but definitely when it's a presidential election, we're all turning to our TVs to see if our particular candidate, whether it be a red or blue, which state is going to fall, what colors. Um, so they're definitely compiling a lot of data sets, a lot of, a lot of information on um, exit polls, you know, uh, polls that are closing, different types of ballots um, and how they're being counted so they can um, present as accurate a picture as possible for those who are staying up late wondering which way their state may have fallen. It's always Speaking interesting. Yes. Larry, this one, it, uh, this is just me making an observation. Um, interesting map because this is the first time I've actually noticed one that had any purple on it. I assume means pretty much a mix of red and blue, right? Yes, obviously there's always a couple of states and, and Florida sometimes has, I mean, obviously while Florida has leaned red in the previous uh, uh, few ele uh, presidential elections, it has it sometimes been considered a purple state as well as the states like Ohio. So the, when you see purple, that tends to mean that the, the, uh, the voting is real close within that state. Just like where if you see light blue, it's obviously leaning uh, blue for Democrat, but there's a not as strong a, compared to like states like California or New York where they're dark blue and similar to the pink states, which are leaning uh, Republican, but they're not as strong as the, you see in the heartland of the country. So that's what tend to what those colors tend to mean again. And that's from ex political experts, polling experts using GIS uh, data sets that they're collecting to create the maps that we see on our, whatever news channel uh, so, or source that you're um, attending to during uh, election year. So some a little bit of a brief history. So the first application, as you can see, be, uh, was created by Charles, and if I pronounce his name wrong, I please forgive me, I think it's uh, pronounced PK, um, in 1832, where he actually did a, a map doing heat, using a heat map demonstration of a cholera outbreak, and he did this all by hand. So imagine how fast he would be able to do using today's software um, to create a similar map for this outbreak in 1832. Larry, we have a, a question in, in the, um, well, we have a couple of comments and questions in the chat. Okay, so I will go ahead. Uh, James's comment is, I am generally curious, does GIFS, excuse me, have access to individual data, like say for instinct, someone who has a criminal background? That's an interesting question. Um, I am not 100% sure of that, of, for that particular question. I know data sets can be made available. Um, obviously, depending on who releases that data. So like say if it's a federal agency um, who, who collected the data, those agencies tend to be more free flowing, more made of more relatively available for the user to access like USGS, uh, National um, Oceanography, NASA, things like that. 
Um, now, if, you're, if it's something that's more of um, collect where data is collected and kept um, for private uh, entities, you know, who are collecting that data, then there might be a paywall behind it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just I haven't come across anything dealing with criminal investigations. I mean, obviously, once somebody is, um, you know, individuals are either uh, through the courts, uh, either freed or incarcerated, that type of data set is made, should be made available because of the fact that it's where a, a public, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is made public, um, but I have yet to um, do any research with that. And James, I believe your mic is open if you'd like to uh, speak up about it. I just wanted to know particularly if um, when GIS is being used, if we're, if it's like, it can track people's individual like experiences, like um, let's just say if I was going to like um, a, like a, a store and I wanted to write a review for it, would that be updated for the GIS system for any sort of like reason like that or? Good question. So you're asking like, so like say if you were to do a Yelp for a, a restaurant, could that data be used? I was, I'm assuming it could be, again, it would depend on how relatively uh, free available, say like, uh, I'm just using Yelp as an example as a, of a platform that I'm, I know if they make, if they make their data available, you know, for someone to use that, to use it to do research. I mean, there's a lot of, um, like I said, through the, um, through the census and through the f different federal agencies where business data can be uh, extrapolated for GIS purposes. Um, if it's put on a private platform or a, pl a social media platform, like say Yelp or others like that, it'd be interesting if I don't, I can't answer hundred percent if they've, so I'm not, I just don't know if they let their information for users to use in GIS mapping. Interesting. So I'm, I'm assuming if they do, yeah, you could definitely use their, inf I mean, if they allow that information to be used, then it would be, a, you would be able to use those data sets in GIS mapping. Yes. All right, thank you. And, uh, and Ilaria has also brought in a, a really interesting uh, perspective on it. And Ilaria, if you would like to uh, uh, mention it. Refresh my memory. Judy, and hi, Lawrence. Uh, yes. yes, my question is if you have any good example of other types of maps that deal with literature, myths, uh, poetry, mm. audio, something that has, doesn't really have a very practical, like uh, hurricane tracking right. or other things, but more uh, imagination, uh, the mapping of imagination. Mm. That's a good question, mapping of imagination. I, I would, I wish I had a, an answer for that. Off the top of my head, I have yet to come across any, but it's not to oh. say that they don't exist. And now that you got me thinking about that in my free time, exactly. I might actually do some digging on that because it, it, I mean, I can't see why I get it. Would, I guess it would just tend to how depending on how the data was collected or inputted. I can't see why, you know, if you're looking at, at, at doing analysis of say, again, throwing a book title out there, you know, uh, say maybe books that were banned in a particular time period and looking at yeah. who reading certain books um, that might take a little bit more um, digging or um, uh, on the researchers to, uh, but I can't see why that data wouldn't be. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of the data that you're putting in. Not everything is necessary. You just upload it from a nice neat website. So you can input the material mm -hmm. yourself. So that would be interesting. I'd have to do some yeah. digging on that. Yeah, if you find some good examples, just give them to me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, if I come across any, I will definitely uh, make them available. I do. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. That's a good question, especially like I said with Band Book Week, always a hot topic, and especially in the library, we always you know promote books and and especially books that were banned. So any type of literature that would be interesting. If I find any, I would definitely forward them to you. Okay. Thank you for sharing that question. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we have another question about accessing um, uh, data, GIS data for Florida specifically. So I have a feeling you probably have some, you do have some access to something for that, right? Yeah, you, there would be definitely um, different, um, depending on the type of data that they're looking. I mean, yeah, for, the, Florida, the Florida state government is pretty, their agencies are pretty uh, uh, good at releasing uh, data uh, sets. Um, to depending on the category, the topic or the 
the category in which some the individual is looking to create a GIS mapping solution or example to. Um, it's just reaching out to them depending on the, the, what data you're looking for. You know, yeah. so if, yeah. if you were looking at it for like wildlife, you know, um, the wildlife the Depart Department of Wildlife would be one yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So yeah, most of the state governments, uh, most of the state uh, agencies, not just Florida, but others in, in general, as well as the federal government, you know, tend to make that these data sets relatively available. Um, that being said, we all know that a federal, let alone state, some state um, agencies, their websites aren't usually the, the easiest to navigate. So it might take a little uh, navigating, a little time, yeah. but yeah, they, they do make their data available. And uh, and Lori has put a link into the into the chat for uh, free GIS data sources. And I will, when we uh, share the, Larry's information out, I will also make sure that that we share that information too. So thank you. You you really have uh, have opened up some amazing. Uh, thought processes, Larry. Thank you. Well, you have a great crowd. Like I said, I would have never thought about doing anything with <laughs> literature, uh, but it has, my, it has the, the juices flowing. So, yes. So thank, you, thank you, everyone. So like I said, th we can thank Charles uh, Paquet, 1832, who did the first spatial mapping. Um, obviously, it's doing with cholera, um, but because of his, his breakthrough, um, we're able to do so much uh, today, and it's, we can thank him for that. So with uh, GIS as an array of data, how can it be analyzed? So if when you're looking at um, a given map, depending on what the uh, topic overall is, you begin to collect, take the data, and you're looking at, so in this case, land, ele uh, land uh, elevation, population density, weather patterns or climate data, uh, noise levels, demographic information, Anything that you can associate with a, um, a particular location, because everything has to be tied to that location. Going back to that, that question about um, uh, literature. So if you were looking at, say, New York City and, you know, and um, spe more specifically, say, Manhattan in 1835 and looking at what books were being banned or even discussed among uh, adults who could read, it'd be really, you could definitely, um, with that data that was have been could be collected, um, begin to create a map to show the heat zones, as they say, who is reading what and where. So definitely. So how is the data? Uh, how do we represent it, or how does GIS represent the data that's uh, inputted? Well, first they begin to create, uh, and this is a very basic um, example of collecting uh, data and then and creating layers. You know, um, and this is just four different layers, very basic. So you have street data, as you see here, buildings, vegetation. And then the final map on the bottom here, we see where they integrate all the different layers to, to that final map that is presented, whether it be on our TV screens or on a website or, you know, through anything where we can access the data, YouTube video. It's all created through layers and um, to create that spatial location. And those layers can, can also contain features, right? So they, you know, each, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting when you think about the maps that they create using GIS. And, you know, some of us, I think about my days of studying maps in history, the old uh, maps of travelers going from, you know, early Europe to uh, the new world. And um, just think about how they drew those maps. And today's maps are, like I said, layers upon layers of different data points and service locations, as you can see here, to create the final mapping. It's not just one simple drawing of what is presented before the eye. It takes a lot of different information and data to create the maps we see that are created with GIS software. So some recommended sources I'll put out there. We have, uh, there'll be links in the further on in this uh, presentation of free GIS sources, as well as the links that uh, my colleague Lori Rebar has put in the chat. Uh, YouTube um, is a very good source to, and I have provide a few links for uh, YouTube videos that will show you how to do a step-by-step -step basic um, working with the software if you're not familiar with it. Um, and we have a GIS corner in the library. Um, so my predecessor, uh, Bruce Barron, who's luckily him, now retired and I'm filling in his shoes. Oh, excuse me, go back here real quick. Um, 
he partnered with the geosciences to create a GIS corner because a lot of the software is uh, strictly used through the geosciences uh, departments on campus, and he wanted to be able to um, allow other researchers, faculty, staff, and students to have access to the, the basic software so they can start to play with it and start to create GIS mapping depending on whatever their topic may be. And I'll a few more slides, Donald. We'll go into more detail about the GIS corner. So as I mentioned, we talked a, a few slides earlier of different types of data sets that are made available. The census is very good for collecting data, as we know. We just had a, a 20, um, our most recent census, the 2020 census go through. They collected a lot of information and they make that available, you know, both for demographics, school districts, businesses, locations, and things like that. So there, there are definitely uh, one to uh, look at when working with date, uh, large data sets. This is a website website here. Um, you could go back to it and it looks at this is deals with international resources. Again, um, a lot of the European countries are providing their are becoming more free with their data um, look as uh, analyzing their populations. Um, but that could be hit or miss depending on the country you're trying to do research in. But that's a, a, a good starting point um, if you're doing uh, research on a particular country for a particular um, topic. And then we have other uh, data sets like ArcGIS Online, has uh, map extensions, uh, USGS, and the United States Geological Survey, um, as well as the National um, Oceanic and um, Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, with uh, information on weather and other components. All very, uh, uh, very good and useful data sets to, um, for that type of information. And it's relatively uh, with no cost to the user. And this is all put out by the federal government. These were um, a couple of well, four uh, tutorials. The first one is actually a, a playlist of 10 that will st uh, put up a UTM library that really is really detailed in stepping you through the process of how to work and create a, uh, an using ArcMap software that we have in our GIS corner um, and how to uh, create a map. Um, as well as the um, ArcGIS Pro Quick Start Tutorial, and that's put out by Arc, um, ArcGIS um, organization. Um, I put this note here because for some reason, the two links in the middle, when they opened up in my browser, says they don't open straight into the video, but if you hit the Browse YouTube, it, it will take you to the video. Um, and I highly recommend, you know, if you're not familiar with the software, take a look at the tutorials. and. Um, and just watch them and, and see where it how it uh, takes you through step by step. Um, that's whether they're um, I myself am not a GIS expert. I don't um, try to come across as what I'm just merely presenting this information to let people know that it's out there, and that we have a GIS corner that's in the library that has access to that software. And the GIS corner is open when that when the library is open. Um, it's in the back. Um, you'll see this on the other side, but it's if you come into the library, it's in the west wing of the library in the back corner. Uh, we have four designated uh, computers with this software. As um, the software can only be accessed with um, FAU login, so it's not even made available to the public or even our PBSC students who come and eventually use the libraries. If you're an FAU student, faculty, or staff member, you can access the GIS software at the, the GIS corner. I'm going to play a video for you real quick. Hi, everyone. My name is David Bordillo, and I'm the current graduate assistant here at the FAU Library in the GIS Corner. So what exactly is the GIS Corner? Well, it is a portion of the library for FAU students, staff, and faculty who would like to have the dedicated computers and assistance with GIS and map making software. Here, there are four computers that contain all the necessary software to complete assignments, projects, or papers that require or would strongly benefit from GIS editing or map creation. It has all the software you need to create maps, edit data, and get results. This includes ArcGIS Pro, ArcMap, ArcCatalog, ArcScene, and ArcGlobe software. And in addition, all computers also contain Microsoft Excel, Word, PowerPoint, along with Google Drive and OneDrive. If you need to schedule an appointment for any assistance or questions related to GIS, on the FEO Library website, you can go to the GIS Subject Guide and Government Information and Map website, click on the GIS Assistance Request form, 
and enter all the relevant information, for example, the day, time, email, and a brief explanation of the issue at hand. The hours for the JS uh, Corner are, mon are Mondays and Thursdays for a dedicated JS assist assistant, in this case me. Otherwise, it's open every single day with, with the library's open. Larry, we have one, we have a question on it. Can we access um, the software on our computers and the link to request assistance? Okay, so the software itself is only located in the JS Corner computers. Um, that's because it's a the licensing for the software is very expensive. Um, we're very gracious to be able to partner with the JS uh, unit on campus to allow us to put it onto four computers. And those are the designated computers uh, that are made available. Like I said, and like my, uh, David said, they are available. Anyone can access them uh, when the library is open. And it's uh, first come first serve pretty much. And I will uh, take you, I will show you, this is the link right here. And I'll, I'll demonstrate towards the end how to find this link um, from our library's homepage as well. Um, where the form is located at. Now, there is, a, I will say this, and there's been a note put on the, the lib guide, or research guide, excuse me. Uh, David has had to cut back his hours because he's had to pick up another TA assignment in the in the program that he is. So he, he's, instead of working two days a week, he's down to one day a week because he couldn't go over a certain number of hours. And I am working on hopefully getting another GIS student in place in the near future. So, um, but there is one day a week. He works Thursdays from three to eight. Uh, but I will show you uh, the research guide as well as how to get uh, to where that form is. And Lori has added the link to request for the uh, uh, GIS assistance request form in the chat also. So this, um, before I take it to the library's homepage, this is uh, the last slide um, with um, the government information to email as well as um, the phone number for government information and maps department, as well as my, because I'm currently in two different offices, working out of two offices. So either phone number, uh, you should be able to reach me with no problem. And with that, let me uh, change my screen out. As Lori has presented you with the link, if you're coming from the library's homepage, the easiest way to access it is go to research guides right here. And then uh, just simply in the search box, type GIS. And then in the very first one, just click on the bold link where it says GIS Information Systems. This will take you into the, the research guide, which has um, a lot of the information that was presented today, as well as information on our GIS corner. Which um, the video link, the link to the video is here again. Our location, as I said, we're in the first floor west air, uh, wing of the library, also known as the Alumni Alcove. It's right near the Government Documents Office, Government Information Maps Office, LY109. Um, and it lets you know about the software that's currently on those computers. Now, if you needed assistance, you could go to the form link here. And then like I said, the form still has the old, the current time because um, these were the hours going into this semester. Um, and but then, unfortunately, David has informed me near the last minute that he was uh, pulled away to do a uh, second uh, TA in his program. But he would be more than well and still be able to do five hours a week. So right now, he's currently working Thursdays from three to eight. So obviously, if you were f filling these forms out and you wanted uh, David's assistance Thursday, uh, you pick a Thursday during the, uh, the time period that he's available from 3D8, so that way uh, this information could be sent to him and then be able to uh, make sure there's a uh, he has a computer ready for you when you're coming in uh, and to guide you or assist you uh, to work on the software if you're not familiar with it. Um, but as I said, the software itself, the corner itself is made available um is open basically um basically this is the office hours for government information and maps uh, but when the library is open uh the corner is open and accessible to anyone with an feu uh, net id and login and and as it mentions here 
definitely want to bring a flash drive as you start to build and use your software, use the software and build your map. You definitely want to be able to save it um, to either a flash drive or to uh, the cloud available. And um, and the, also through here, you can see we, uh, there's different uh, GIS data sets that are available. Again, there's a lot more that's out there than I presented in this uh, brief uh, presentation. So definitely, um, as well as tutorials um, that are out there uh, for those who want to do a little bit uh, self-study before they start using the software. Um, so if there's with that, I will thank you for your time in the presentation and available for any questions that the the crowd may have. And I'm going to uh, to mention and and again it. It's in the it's in the link in there, and I will share all this information out. But Alaria has uh, created a um, she said she's created a map with Google Earth and IZI Travel, which will take you to the Italian soundscapes in Florida map. And uh, Christina, your mic has been unmuted. Please, uh, well, I think it has been unmuted. Uh, please feel free to uh, to comment as well. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this presentation. It was super interesting. Um, and uh, and I am actually, uh, I'm the uh, lab manager for the Department of Biological Sciences at Davy, and I'm, I've been copy pasting all those links and taking notes and I'm going to pass it along to uh, the graduate students, which I also sent uh, forward at the invitation for this seminar. So I hope some of them were able to connect today. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, about GIS, something that I found very interesting uh, watching a, a show on the National Geographic um, channel uh, a while ago. Uh, there is a professor um, that she's actually an archeologist and she's using uh, GIS and uh, something called satellite remote sensing for archaeology to detect new archaeological sites. So uh, that's an additional um, application that it's now being used, uh, that it's being utilized uh, using GIS to um, locate archaeological sites. And, you know, it takes her, um, you know, it, it's just a, a system that it, it helps to find things faster than it would be, you know, just using traditional methods of uh, finding archaeological sites. So they see, uh, you know, changes um, in, in terms of um, vegetation, uh, topography, and, and things that are indicative that maybe there is something underneath. So uh, she's done a lot. She's uh, her specialist. Uh, she's specializing in Egyptian archaeology and um, she's actually found uh, lots of things over there uh, using the system. I just wanted to share that and maybe you can look up her, um, I don't know, maybe the, the, the show or that episode in particular is available. Um, yeah. yeah, just wanted Thank to you share so that. Much. Thank, yes, you, Thank you, Christine. I will. I will definitely look, look it up. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's truly really interesting where if you look at where we've progressed from 1832, doing it by hand to like, as you mentioned, using satellite capability to really help um, speed up the process mm -hmm. um, and to create those uh, GIS maps to help find um, the artifacts. Um, yeah, so she's at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, I looked it up because uh, I had seen it a long time ago and I even forgot her name. Her name is Sarah Parkak and uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham. Yeah, she's in the Department of, um, I think, Anthropology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would definitely look into that. And, and maybe if I can find a clip or if we have a license to uh, whatever video she's done using that software, or at least let's keep talking about the software, see about incorporating it into the lib guide or the research guide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I just wrote down what I thought it sounded like on her name. And uh, for all of you joining us, please know that I will be uh, compiling all of the links that have been shared today, including one that uh, that Lori has shared with us where she, she has a, a repository where she just drops a variety of links into different topics. So, uh, okay, thank you, Parchak. Okay, I was close. <laughs>
All right. Thank you so much. And we will be sending uh, as much of this information out as we possibly can. Um, so I, I, th I thank all of you for your uh, your amazing for your contributions and for your interest. This is uh, this has been fascinating. <laughs> yes, thank you very much.